again. I know what some of you are thinking. I can see it on your faces. You are thinking, I am so glad we're about to talk about money in church. <laughs> I, I get that right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe not. I'm still kind of working on the whole mind reading thing. And, and in fact, I, I know honestly, like some of you are thinking just the opposite. Some of you, you are, you're, you're new to church. Some of you have never been to church before. And part of the reason why, maybe a lot of the reason why, is because you've thought or you've heard this whole I learned that all the church ever talks about is money. And this is just confirming your suspicion. And you're thinking, see, I knew it. Again, I don't know what you're thinking, but that would be a pretty common sentiment. But let me tell you this we are going to talk about money, it's gonna be okay. Before we talk about money, I'm gonna tell you why we're gonna talk about money because why really matters in anything we talk about in church, especially money. So, so here's why we're gonna talk about money and this is like a really, really easy explanation. You ready? Jesus did. Jesus, some of you'd be surprised by that, honestly. Like Jesus talked about money. And Jesus talked about money a lot. In fact, he could be kind of rightfully accused of being sort of like a broken record when it came to talking about money and possessions and stuff and things. During his ministry, Jesus often taught in a style of stories we'd call parables. He was a master storyteller. You should read of stories he told, but he told these parables. And parables are like metaphorical stories about life and faith that taught these very practical realities. Always telling a story. Let me tell you a story. Did I tell you about the time when, and in the scriptures, we have 38 recorded parables of Jesus. That's, I'm sure he told many more than that. We have 38 recorded. 16 of them deal either directly or indirectly with money and possessions and things. During Jesus's most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, it's Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. You should read it. It would take you like 15 minutes. It's, it's just incredible, life-changing stuff. In that sermon, he talked about money. When Jesus was surrounded by large crowds of people, which was almost always, he would many times engage them in a conversation about money. He, he didn't avoid the topic. He didn't tiptoe around it. He didn't apologize. In fact, it appears that he would sort of like get to that conversation as fast as he possibly could. Now, now here's what I know, that if we were to have Jesus at SoFlo as a guest speaker some Sunday, which would be like a huge upgrade compared to what we're used to. And I can say that, you can't, but I can. If we had Jesus, I can tell you this, there's like a really good chance what he would stand up here and talk to you about is money, possessions, and stuff and things. If he didn't, there's a good chance instead he would talk about hell, which in the minds of many people is the only thing worse than talking about money. Maybe not even as bad as talking about money. I'm telling you, you may not wanna have Jesus as a guest speaker if he offers. You may not like it. Jesus often talked about money and for some very distinct reasons why, some of which we'll get into in this series, but the really easy reason why we will be a church that talks about money is because Jesus talked about money. We're a brand new church. We're about, we're about seven months old now. We're just learning to crawl. And so one of the things you need to know about us as a church, if you don't know this already, is that we're a church, we will talk about everything the Bible talks about. Some of you are looking for a church. You're here for the very first time, and I hope this will be the church for you, but if it's not, you continue on your search, I would just encourage you to avoid staying at a church that'll avoid anything the Bible has to say. If they, if they will only talk about what's comfortable, if they will only talk about what's comfortable, if they will only talk about what's popular, if they will only talk about what's easy to hear, man, I, I, would, I would just not be a part of that church. I'm just telling you that. We will talk about everything that the Bible talks about. We, we will talk about faith and fear and joy and anxiety and depression. We'll talk about heaven and hell and death. We'll talk about marriage and divorce and gender. We'll talk about sin and salvation. We will here talk about sex and the afterlife. Someone once said this. They said, hey, if you want to draw a large crowd of people, talk about sex sex or the afterlife? They said, if you really want a large crowd of people, answer this question, will there be sex in the afterlife? So that's going to be our talk next week. Invite your friends and family. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. We'll probably have an Easter-sized crowd next week. You understand my point. We will talk about everything the Bible talks about it the way the Bible talks about it, which is in love. So absolutely, we'll talk about money. So these next few weeks, we're going to do this series you see up here called Million Dollar Questions. Now, Million Dollar Question 
is a phrase that we use in the English language to communicate like a high stakes question or a really, really important question. And each week we're gonna deal with a really high stakes question in regards to money that, that applies to all of us equally. And so our million dollar question for today is this, is, is how are you managing? Now, if I could sit down with each one of you individually, which I hope to get the opportunity to do as time passes. And we could meet for like tea or coffee or have a meal together. And I I was able to ask you this question in regards to money, how are you managing? I I know some of what I would hear, some of the responses. I would hear, you know, I'm I'm doing okay. Like the the investments are are holding strong and the cash flow is steady. And others of you would say, well, I'm I'm buckling down to prepare for retirement. Some of you would say, man, I'm, I'm really struggling because I took some risks in my investment portfolio and they did not go well and so I'm farther behind than when I started. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Some of you would say that. Some of you would say, man, every month it seems like there is more month than money. Or you may say, man, I don't have much but I'm, 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 I'm making it work. And these are just a few of the things I would hear. Some of you feel like, man, those are the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly what I would say. Those are all very, very legitimate questions to this question or answers to this question, how are you managing? But that's not what I mean when I ask how are you managing? When I ask how are you managing, I'm actually getting at the idea of, of ownership. And unless and until we all understand the idea of ownership when it comes to stuff, we will never be able to navigate finances in a healthy, God-honoring way. So let me explain really clearly what I mean when I talk about ownership. It is this. You won't have to write it down. It's easy to remember. God owns everything. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14 says, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Psalm 24.1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Let me simplify that verse even more. Nothing is ours. Everything is his. The sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the the mountains, the the plains and the the valleys, the forests and the jungles, every moat of of dust, every grain of sand, everything is his. The Bible, in the Bible he says, or it says uh, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I don't even know how many cattle live on one hill. I think it's a lot that he owns a cattle live on a thousand hills. That's his way of saying, I own it all. In the Bible God says, the gold is mine and, and the silver is also mine. Everything, 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 everything is his. That means your house title says your name, even though it's really the banks, it says your name, but it's his. And so are the houses next to yours and those that are across the street, that's his. And, and maybe the extra car, you, maybe you saved up to, to like drive it on the weekends and it's really nice, it, it's great car. He loves it, and and it's his car. He's glad he has that car. Like, that's his. And and the clothes you wear, they may not be his style, but they're his. And and the food you eat is his, and the bank account is his. And and that, that, that little stash of cash you have tucked away that your husband or wife doesn't know about, he's got his eye on it because it's his. And your 401k account is his, and all your investment portfolio is his. Now, when, when we are born, We have some new babies in here, and this is true about them. When we are born, there's like this word that is hardwired onto our minds and quickly makes it down to our tongues. It is the word mine. So you know it. I knew you did, okay? It is is mine. And, And if you knew, it'd be fun to know, but if you knew the first five words you spoke in your earthly life, I can almost assure you in maybe your native language, the word was Mine. We, we begin that, er, it's like mine, mommy, and daddy. That's the way it usually goes. Like we begin the word early and often. And if you have a little toddler in your house, you know just how true that is. That they're barely walking, they're barely talking, they, they pee their pants by day and they poop their pants by night and they run around the house saying, mine, 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 mine. Now, from God's perspective, when he hears us say mine about treasures and trinkets and money and possessions and stuff, it must be a little bit like when we see our snotty-nosed, diaper-wearing kid run around the house saying, mine, mine, mine. He's like, oh, isn't that cute? He thinks he owns something. Oh, you know, like for God, it's, it's probably a little bit laughable, but also probably heartbreaking because he knows that if we don't ever understand the idea of ownership, then everything in life, in faith, and especially finances will be off kilter. One of my favorite authors named A.W. Tozier, he said it best. He said, 
As long as we think we own anything, that thing owns us. As soon as we know that we own nothing, God owns us. Everything is God's. Now, I wanna be really honest with you. I'm human too, like you are. This goes against the grain. Like even if you've been in church your entire life, you've loved God your whole life, you've been following Jesus your whole life, or, or maybe you're brand new to this, it's just a difficult pill to swallow this idea that like you own nothing, I own nothing, we own nothing, because you're the one that works the overtime. You're the one that stood at the assembly line for all those years. You're the one that has the calluses on your hands and feet. You're the one that missed the birthday parties and, and you didn't get to be at all the holidays. And, and you're the one that came up with the marketing strategy and you're the one that cut the deal and you're the one that had the business idea in the first place. And so because you, you, you did the work and put in the time, then it just naturally seems that the money and the possessions and stuff is also yours, yours, yours. It's just, it's not. It's his. And so here's the idea. We all have to wrap our minds around it. We're all in this together, by the way. None of us are ahead of the others. God owns everything. We own nothing, but we're all managers of some things. So when I ask that question again, how are you managing? What, I, what I'm not asking is, you know, how are things going with finances? Is it going the way you hoped or, or not? What I'm ask, actually asking is how are you managing the resources that God has entrusted to you? Think of that idea. That's a paradigm shift moment in our hearts and minds. Like everything you touch and have and eat and experience and enjoy and you're surrounded by everything, God is like, I'll entrust you with that. 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 So it's how are you managing what he has entrusted you with? Are you managing it in a way that honors him? Are you managing it in a way that pleases him? Are you managing it in a way that would incline him to trust you with more? Are you managing in a way that would incline him to trust you with less? It's, it's how are you managing? Now, a lot of us, we would struggle to even answer that question because some of us are just now like, like getting our heads and our eyes looking straight again at this paradigm shift reality that God owns everything and we own nothing. And we're like, I'm managing God's stuff. I, I didn't know that. And so we're not even really prepared to answer that question. How are you managing? So maybe, maybe the better million dollar question for this weekend is actually this. It's how does God want me to manage his stuff? Maybe we need to like back up and, and start there. I, I think that's the right question. Some of you, you're, you're financial investors. So you get to Spend your time investing other people's money. That sounds fun to me. I want to sign up for that. Like, that's what you do. And, and maybe you have all these clients. I, I bet you don't have a client that just shows up at your office, drops a bag of gold on your desk, and just says, hey, do whatever you want with it. I don't care. Just let me know. If you do have a client like that, have them drop the next bag of gold here, and I'll take good care of it for you, okay? Like, if, if that's how your clients roll, like, I want in that action. But that's not how it goes. You sit down, and you have a conversation, and they call you, and they text you. Maybe they annoy you with emails, but you talk about goals and ideas and concepts and strategies of what they want their resources to accomplish. And then, to the very best of your ability, then you manage that accordingly. The same is absolutely with God. He's saying, I'm entrusting you with this and this, and this, and he has a very specific kind of idea in mind of how he wants you to manage his resources during the time that you have his resources, which won't be forever, by the way. And so again, the question is, how does God want me to manage his stuff? You may be expecting right now that I'm gonna give you like a formula or a complex equation, or I'm gonna have a series of spreadsheets like that we're gonna outline with my laser pointer of step one, two, and through 59 of what God wants you to do and how he wants you to do it. I'm not. You will be surprised at the simplicity of how God wants you to manage his stuff. And it's simply this. I'm gonna say it again and again. Give some, save some, spend some. Like, I can do that. Like, it's really, really simple. It's like, give some, save some, spend some. If you just summarized everything the Bible has to say from beginning to end about money and possessions and resources and stuff and things and trinkets and treasures, it would just come down to this. I mean, I don't need a theology degree to know this. It's just like, give some and save some and spend some. If you could have a meeting with God in his heavenly office, if he has a heavenly office and you could have an appointment, that would be amazing. It'd be like, so God, like you, you trusted me with some of your stuff, God, and I don't know if that was a good idea or not, but you did. How do you want me to manage it? He would say, you don't need to write it down. Just remember this, give some save some, and spend some. What I love about God's intention for his stuff is that it equally applies to all of us. 
Like socioeconomically, we have like a, a widespread on the spectrum right here in this room and a part of our church. So if you're living in the lower class, socioeconomically speaking, and you're striving to get to the middle class, or you're the middle class and you really hope to get to the upper class, or the upper class and you're just like reaching for the stars, the, the, the plan's the same. Whether you're a teenager working your, your very first job or you're maybe middle of your career, or you're a retiree that's just working a side hustle trying to make ends meet, the, the plan's the same. Whether you've invested millions of dollars in the stock market that you're, you're so kind of anxious about or, or you don't even have enough to take a simple trip to the supermarket, the plan is the same. It's, it's give some, save some, and spend some. So we're just gonna very briefly talk about each one of those as we look at uh, managing in a way that honors God. So the first one there is, is give some. And, and I wanna admit to you, I'm not accidentally starting with give some. Because according to God's plan in God's economy, if you don't first give some, then you've already guaranteed that you're not gonna be honoring him well with the rest of what you have. You can, you can save a lot and you can spend a lot, but, but if you don't first give some, you're not gonna be honoring God. And, and let me tell you that the idea of give some, that was not my idea, don't blame me. You promise, don't blame me. It was also no pastor. No pastor was sitting in his office one day be like, oh, I know what we can do. We can tell people to give some. Like, yeah, and, hey, pastors, you need to tell people to give some. Like, no, it was God's idea long before any of us were around. You go all the way back in the Old Testament, beginning of the Bible, and we find God intentionally building out a relationship with a certain group of people. They were called the Israelites. They were, they were the Jewish people. And he said, okay, you're gonna be my people. And, and he didn't choose the Israelites because they were better than anyone else. He didn't choose the Jewish people because they were good. He chose them because he was good. And he said, this is gonna be the group of people that I'm gonna lead and I'm gonna love and I'm gonna protect. And out of them, one day will come the savior, Jesus, the Messiah into the world. And so he said, okay, you and me, we're gonna have like this incredible relationship. And, and so he was very clear mapping out how the relationship dynamic was gonna go. He knew that they needed some guidance. They needed some guardrails about how to live well and love well and, and make wise decisions. And so he literally gave them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws about how to form their lives. He didn't wanna leave anything up for, for chance. And so he gave them direction about relationships and about discipline and about diet and about work and about worship. And he, and he also, as he's building these relationships, he was just really clear with him. He's like, hey, I'm gonna be generous with you, but here's how we're gonna handle like the resource thing. And so this is just one of the passages he spells out the simple truth, Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. He says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Now, eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place you will choose as a dwelling for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. You, you hear what God is saying? Give some. It's like, I'm gonna be super generous. Like, I'm gonna give you the land and I'm gonna give you the seed and I'm gonna give you the rain and I'm gonna give you the harvest and I'm gonna give you the place and the plate to eat it off of and I'm gonna give you the fire to cook it in. Uh, give some. Some's a really vague term. But he didn't leave it vague. He got very specific there. If you see it there in other places, he actually used the word tithe. Tithe actually means uh, 10%. And, and so he says to them, hey, uh, of everything I give you, you need to give me 10%. That's what he's saying. See, the ownership idea was the same then. They didn't own anything. They just managed some things. And so when he was talking to them about this idea of give some, of tithe, he, listen, he wasn't saying, hey, 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 give me some of yours stuff. He was saying, no, return to me some of my stuff. And he didn't just say some. He's like, here's how it's gonna go. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a tithe. It's gonna be 10%. We're gonna be good because I'm gonna be so generous with you and you're gonna eat till your belly's so full and your family's gonna be taken care of. It's gonna be great but you're gonna to return to me a tithe. Now, tithe is like the churchiest of all words. Like, I'm sure at work, no one around the water cooler is like, hey, how's the tithe going? Like, no one uses that word in conversation. You're never gonna see it on social media. Let, let me, in practical ways, say what tithe is in, in our culture. Here it is. So it's dime out of every dollar. That, that's what he's just saying to them. He's like, hey, I'm gonna give you a lot of these, and for every one of these I give you, I just want you, you can barely even see it, it's so small. He's like, I just want you to give me one of these. He's like, for every one of these, every one of these. So it's a dime out of every dollar, dime out of every dollar. He's teaching them how this relationship with him was gonna work. And by the way, when he gave these uh, directions about life back in the Old Testament, uh, he wasn't actually making recommendations because he's not in the recommendation business because he's 
God. So when you're God, you don't make recommendations. You just say how it's gonna be. And so he wasn't like, you know what, man, when you get those incredible harvests that you're gonna come because I'm gonna pour the rain and the, the soil's gonna be so fertile. I'm gonna give you the energy to do all the work and, and give you a place to store it all in a way to eat it. He's like, when you, when you do all that, like, you know, as you're working out the budget, if you, if you could, you know, slide about 10% of that my way, that'd be awesome. And he wasn't like, you know, I know you have hopes and dreams and aspirations, and if you, if you don't mind not forgetting me, that's good. No, no, no. He's just like, no, every dollar I give you, it's going to be a dime. Now, now, here's what I love. It's not only did God tell them what to do, he went to the why. He told them why to do what he wanted them to do. It said there, so that you will learn to revere the Lord your God always. God's intention with this idea of tithing that he came up with. It wasn't a financial strategy to make sure he could stay on top of his bills. He's doing okay. Like, he's not afraid of a recession. He's not worried about the rise and the fall. He doesn't pay attention to the stock market. He's not worried about the housing market and how it's gonna go. He's, he's okay. Listen, God actually does not have an FPL bill. And I'm so jealous of him for that. I don't know if you're supposed to be jealous of God, but I'm jealous he has no FPL. He's got the sun. He has no water bill because he made the oceans. And he has no mortgage payment because he can live in the expanse of the galaxies he has designed. God does not need money. The idea that he would need you to help him with his bills is absolutely laughable. God does not need money. God, though, here, please hear this. God wants our hearts. I don't know if you've ever realized this connection on your own or not. God teaches us this in his word, and if we're honest, we know it. There's an intrinsic connection between money and treasures and our hearts. That's why years later, Jesus said this. He said, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. The principle Jesus is teaching then and now is money follows the heart and the heart follows money. By the way, that principle is still very much true. You could uh, study through your own finances privately and look about what you spend and where you spend and how often you spend and how much you spend, and you could easily draw a straight line back to your heart, what you value, what you care about, uh, what matters to you, what's a big priority to you. Um, It's true about my life as well. Um, If you didn't know me and you were gonna you know, just kind of review my financial portfolio, which wouldn't take you much time. It's not much of a portfolio, but if you were to review, review through my finances, you would immediately come to two conclusions. Be like, this guy loves God, and this guy has an infatuation with someone named Papa John. (laughs) He dropped something off at my house last night. And both of those things are true about me, like money, follows the heart and the heart follows money. That's just true. You would come to some other conclusions about me as well, but those would be the first two that would come to your mind. God knew that if he put this system in place, he knows what he's doing, that hey, first, remember first is gonna come to me. He would stay in the center of their lives because do you know God doesn't wanna be like a part of your life? He's not looking for a bit role in your life. He's not looking to be a supporting cast role in your life. God wants to be your life, the center of your life, the top of the life, the bottom of your life, the, the sides of your life. He wants to be your whole life. Now, I'll acknowledge to you that our lives as uh, you know, followers of Jesus, is not, it's not measured by the Old Testament. Like We're not checking off boxes and trying to get a good score so that we can somehow earn the love of God. We already have the love of God. We live under the grace of Jesus. Thank God for that. And in the New Testament, the Bible, Jesus built upon, he didn't get rid of, he built upon uh, the Old Testament. So we're not, we're not measured by the Old Testament. I wanna tell you that, but the principles are still the same, that God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, still wants to be very much a center of your life. And it's still true that money follows the heart, and the heart follows money. And, and he just knows that if you give him the first time of every dollar he trusts you with, he will be front and center in your life. And if you don't, I'm just telling you, he, he probably won't. I've lived in both of those seasons of life. So he said, here's how I want you to manage. I want you to give some, and then he says this, save some. In the Old Testament, everyone could take a deep breath now, okay, because we got past the give some part. So in the Old Testament, there's a, there's a writing called Proverbs, and Proverbs love it. It's amazing. It was written by a guy named Solomon, who the Bible talks about as being the wisest man who has ever lived. And so Proverbs is just filled up with these wise things about life, like practical wisdom. You would read it and be like, yeah, that makes sense. I agree with that. Yeah, that's kind of how the world operates. That's how relationships should go. And in Proverbs, he gives some practical wisdom about every single aspect of life, including finances, oftentimes in regards to saving. Here's some of what he wrote. Proverbs 21, 5. Uh, He said, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Hmm, that's true. Proverbs 13, 11. Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. 
Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. His words, not mine. Uh, Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. Now, personally, I've not learned most of my life lessons from ants. If so, I'd walk around with breadcrumbs biting people's ankles. That's not how like I roll, okay? But you understand what he is saying there. It's woven into the rest of his writing as well. He's like, he's like, save some. Saving comes easier to some than others. For instance, it doesn't come easy to me. It comes easily to my wife. So, perfect example, when my wife and I got married, um, on the day of our wedding, we had a collective net worth of about $5,000, We were thousandaires, you could say, I guess. So we had a collective net worth of about $5,000, and that is because the day we got married, my wife had $5,000. And so we had a net worth, I actually had a negative net worth. She probably had like seven and had minus two, so it equaled five. Like saving, and that's just true, saving is a discipline I've had to learn. It's a discipline everyone at some point has to learn. Jesus once said this, get this. He said, do not worry about tomorrow. He did not say, pretend tomorrow doesn't exist. And so if you haven't done so already, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but we need to learn to save and and we can just start small. You're not going to develop a life savings overnight, but you can do it day and night by day and night by day and night. I remember the very first time that I ever made um, a deposit in my uh, retirement account. When you're in ministry, it's called a 403B instead of a 401K, same thing, it's a retirement account. And I made the very first deposit in that, and to be honest, it felt like so small and so minuscule and so insignificant. I was like, why am I even doing this? Like, I could just use this money to call Papa John and at least fill my belly. Like, that'd probably be a better use of this money. It seems so insignificant, but, but I made the deposit. And then I just kept doing it, small, 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 kept doing it. 15 years later, I can tell you, I have a really new friend. He's a, a best friend called Compound Interest. It's a very, very good thing. You should try it out. So, so start small if you've got to and stay small if you need to. Resist the temptation to rely on a magic windfall happening later on in life. You're gonna win the lottery or you're gonna get a large inheritance from a step uncle you didn't even know you had. That happens sometimes, but not usually. Don't, don't do that and just instead just save. Now, now saving is not easy. If it was, everyone would do it. But, but if you just do it persistently, little by little, little by little, day and night, day and night, you'll just be so glad you did. And so students, can I talk to you? Students, if, if you're working your very first job, give God the first time at least out of every dollar and save at least the next time out of every dollar. You'll be glad you did. And if you're in the middle of your career and earning really, really well and you're buying all these things and having all these experiences, give God God at least the first dime out of every dollar, save at least the next dime of every dollar. If you're a retiree and you're working a few side hustles just to try to make that social security stretch, give God the first dime of every dollar and save at least the next dime of every dollar. Saving isn't flashy or glamorous, but it's healthy and holy. Saving minimizes unnecessary stress and anxiety later in life from living beyond your means. And unfortunately, I've experienced a whole lot of that when we first got married and it was in my early 20s. So one clarification I wanna make about saving is this, is very important, is saving is holy, hoarding is not. Spending can be unhealthy. Did you know saving can be unhealthy? Because saving is holy, but hoarding is not. So of course, it's like, well, how do you, how do you know that you're hoarding? Let, let me give you a few examples. When, when the abundance of savings you have has become a source of pride, you're no longer just saving, you're hoarding. When you're saving at the expense of giving, you're hoarding. If you always have to find new and creative ways to tuck more and more and more and more, and more money away, and we're all so happy for you, it's actually not saving, it's, it's hoarding. And, and so set some responsible savings goals and, and go after those, even be aggressive, like prepare really well for life. But if you start finding your confidence and your security in your identity and what you have saved, it's no longer saving, it's hoarding. So save, but don't hoard. Never allow yourself to cling too tightly what doesn't even belong to you. So don't be stingy and also don't be flippant because neither represent well the one who owns what you're just managing. So give some, save some, and I wish we could have a drum roll right now, the moment we've all been waiting for, spend some, all right? Like where are my spenders out here? It's okay to raise your hand. Who's a spender? There's more than four of us. You guys are lying in church again, okay? Like spend some. Now, I love spenders. Listen, we would be in trouble if it was just us, though. We would, oh, it'd be bad. So let, let, me, let me show you right here. 
how, how generous God is. Yeah. He gives you every dollar you have. Any dollar that's ever come through your hands or your pocket or your account or you found out in your couch pillow. Christian, it's, he gave it to you. So he gives you every dollar. And every dollar he gives, he's just like, hey, give me the first dime. Remember, so small you can barely see it. Give me the first dime. Save at least the next dime. And he's like, those final seven or eight dimes, go at it. Spend, have fun, build your life. It's great. Like there's so much freedom in, in the spending. You know, when you study the Bible, what you're not gonna find, you're not gonna find this long list of rules about how to spend the final seven or eight dimes. You, you also don't have to be you know, worried that God is gonna slap your hand if you spend one of the dimes incorrectly or you pass the threshold or you know, it wasn't quite right, this instead of that. No, no, like there's a whole lot of freedom in how to deal with and how to manage the, the final seven or eight dimes. There's, there's this mentality that develops in certain sectors of faith people. And I'm not, I'm not even sure how or why this happens. I kind of grew up in it a little bit. There's another extreme too, but in this extreme, it's like, well, once you start loving God, and once you start following Jesus, you can't have nice things anymore. You can't do fun stuff. Like there's a limit of how nice it can be. And do you know we always set the limit like a little bit higher than where we live. So if anyone's beyond us, like they're past the limit. That's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. Like a lot of the most faithful men and women of God in the Bible, they were actually really wealthy people, lived really luxurious lives. I'm not telling you you need or even should go live a crazy luxurious life, but like people did that loved God. Eat good food. Go on great trips, make memories, live in a comfortable house, joy, drive an enjoyable car, like wear stylish clothes if you prefer. There's a, there's a whole lot of freedom in the spending of the final seven or eight dimes. And here's the idea that if you give the first dime and save at least the second dime, you're gonna enjoy the spending so much more because you will be honoring God preparing for the future God has for you and enjoying the goodness of God all at the same time. You'll have a ball with the final seven or eight dimes of every dollar God has given you. So in the Bible, there's not all these rules about how to spend, but there's a few biblical principles I would just encourage you to keep in mind as I finish this up. The, the first one is this, is spend with eternity in mind. Everything we buy here is temporary. Even the nicest cars, are gonna end up in the junkyard. It's hard to believe, but even the sweet minivan I drive that the doors don't work, the visor fell off at 160,000 miles, it's one day gonna be in the junkyard. I might drop it off there later on this afternoon. Like everything, all cars are gonna end up in the junkyard. The nicest homes are gonna be torn down and replaced. You don't believe me? Go on a drive down Billionaire's Row on Palm Beach Island today and you'll see it happening every other house. Jewelry fades, clothes wear out, shoes wear out. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer up here. I'm just being honest with you that we live in a very temporal world. And so spend on the temporary, but do spend money with the eternity in mind as well. Like spend some money on organizations that advocate for widows and orphans. Spend some money on appropriate battles of social justice. Spend some money helping to elevate people that have been pressed down their whole life. Spend some money bringing a taste of heaven down to earth. Spend money on the temporary, but also spend with an eye on the eternal. Also, I'll just tell you, spend with realistic expectations. Don't spend in search of gaining lasting satisfaction. Don't spend trying to increase your self-confidence. Don't, don't spend trying to acquire hope and peace and joy. Don't spend trying to become more loved or more accepted. If you spend for any of those reasons, you're gonna end up so empty and so disappointed. By the way, there's a reason some of us live so empty and disappointed because we do tend to spend these ways. We do tend to spend with these motivations, with these expectations in mind. So I just encourage you, when you spend, no matter where you spend or how much you spend or what your rhythm of spending is, every now and then at least pause and ask this question, why am I spending this money? If you just do that, I would assume that the pattern of your spending will change and you maybe even find yourself spending less. One more idea to keep in mind as you spend the final seven or eight dimes of every dollar, spend with gratitude. As you spend, however it is you spend, remember there's not all these rules about it, God's not gonna slap your hand. I'm just saying remember whose money you're spending. It's not yours, it's his. I know you worked and I know you got the birthday gift and I know you received an amazing inheritance and that's awesome, but it's, it, it's his. And so I'm just saying, spend with gratitude. Whether he's given you a little bit you can afford to spend or, or a huge amount you can afford to spend, spend with gratitude. Be grateful for all the freedom he gives. 
Be grateful that he shared with you and let you spend. Be grateful that he asked so little in return. He's like, no, those seven or eight dimes, you're, you're good. Go for it. Like, like, like spend, be grateful. And, and so the, the shoes you wear and, and the food you eat and the car you drive and the house you live in and the pillow you lay on and the TV you watch, just, just be grateful. In, in my family, I have the role of grocery shopper. So for about the last 10 years or so since our daughter Hazel was born, almost 10 years, I've been the family grocery shopper. And when I tell people that, it always sounds so noble. But can I admit it to you, confess in front of my wife for the first time, I don't do it for noble reasons at all. I do it because then I can pick out whatever I want with no questions asked. It's a privilege that comes to being the shopper. My wife just found out why I actually do it. So I love actually doing the grocery shopping. It's like, I'll take this and that and another box of donuts. And, and you can just do it when, when you're the shopper. So we have you know, six hungry mouths in our family, so there's you know, a lot of shopping trips. It's not like a weekly thing, it's a daily or hourly thing. We're buying groceries, but sometimes it'll be a really large trip of groceries, like yesterday, and, and I'll call my wife head and be like, hey baby, can you have the ducklings lined up to help carry the groceries in to the house, which at least one of the four usually will carry at least one bag into the house. So I will like, yeah, but I need some help, there's a lot. So, so we'll get them all loaded and we'll get it set out on the countertop, and, and, and not always, not always, but sometimes, my wife will tell you that in that moment, while they're still sitting in bags, I've gathered up the kids and, the wife and my wife and said, hey God, thank you for these groceries. Thank you that we have the resources and we're gonna know we're gonna be able to have something to eat this week. Thank you for these groceries. And I never do that with our kids or, or tell you that to sound super spiritual. I'm absolutely not. What I, I, the reason I do that and I need to do it more is I never wanna pretend that, that we have what we have because of me. And I never wanna presume that we're always gonna have what we have. And so just, just grateful as I push that cart to the car and load the groceries up and get them unloaded. And I'm just telling you, whether it be groceries or, or gifts or gas or gummy bears or even a G-Wagon, if you roll like that, just, just spend with gratitude. So next week, well, we're gonna pick up the conversation with another million dollar question, but I just hope you'll always, always, always remember this truth that God owns everything, we manage some things. And if you wanna manage in a way that honors God, I'm sure you do, and I want to. It's, it's really simple, we can all do it. It's just, it's just give some, save some, and then spend some. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful. You are so generous, Lord. When we believe the truth, and I do, that it's actually all yours, and you're just letting us manage some of what's yours, I'm actually shocked by your generosity. When I think about the clothes I wear and the air I breathe and the water I drink and, and the vacations I go on and the TV I watch and the bed I have to sleep in, it's just, you're so generous, Lord. And we just wanna manage in a way that honors you, God. It's, there's no guilt involved, it's not about shame. It's about honor, honoring the one who gave us his stuff to manage. And so, Lord, I pray that when you look at our lives and even look at our church family, us as a church, how we handle resources, we just wanna do it in a way that honors you. And we're so thankful that you give us so much freedom in how to do it. It's just give some and save some and spend some and it'll avoid a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, and it really give us the freedom to enjoy your goodness. God, I pray that we'd be a generous, generous people and a really wise and God-honoring people with the resources you've entrusted us with, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name.